Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. We're at the end of January 2019. This is a an independent uh, Russian Orthodox Nationalist podcast uh, lecture series, really. And in order to keep it independent, keep it on the air, I require donations from my friends and listeners to the extent that you've gained anything from this. Over the last however many years, uh, you know, 10 years since I've been doing this, I ask you to assist me in, in that regard. My website is www.rushjournal.org, and my print essays are there, books, link to my Patreon page, donation button, and everything else. My book on the Soviet Union will be a revisionist essays on the Soviet Union will be coming out in a few months uh, from the Barnes Review Press. I have a draft right now that I need to uh, correct and send back, and uh, it should be a very short time after that. Um, but I've been bombarded with questions on the Venezuelan situation. Since the show has been in existence, I've been talking about Chavez. If you go to my... Uh, my uh, my show's archives from when it first began, I talked about him, uh, saying the same things I'm saying now, I made the same predictions I'm making now. My predictions back then, of course, have come true in every respect. Um, so, but there's a lot more at stake here. It's, it's Venezuela is a, is a case study. Um, the script is the same. Uh, the the accusations are the same. The fact that Americans, you know, these pundits and, and and airheads, you know, they they see it's the same script over and over again, one country after another. They just you know they cut and paste it and just change the name of the country, and they see this and, and don't question it. I want to remind you guys of something very important. The American press has no obligation to educate anybody. That's not their purpose. Um, you know, in the same sense that professional wrestling is not a sport, the American media is not an educational institution. It has no obligation or interest in educating anybody. It has absolutely no, there is no requirement for them to tell the truth. The only requirement is to maintain advertisers, and that requires uh having readers and listeners. That's their only concern. That's their only uh, that's their only goal. People have the impression that they're, you know, they're they're un- they're honor bound or, or even legally bound to tell the truth and to be objective. They have no obligation. They have no interest in that, uh, and they have no no purpose other than not only, of course, to to build their advertising revenue, but just as importantly to promote liberalism globally because that is in their their personal and financial interest. So going to the press to learn about a country is, is ridiculous. You may learn some interesting things. There may be some facts there. But uh, as far as the, the context of what's happening there, they have no obligation or even knowledge sufficient to, to educate anybody. They have no obligation to do that. Um, mass society, the concept that many of you are familiar with, it's a phenomenon really that's run by muckraking journalism. Um, and what happens when, when journalists run things, especially the vulgar, uh, a-critical, very ignorant crop that comes out of Columbia University and all the rest of it, is that labels tend to fill in for reality. People are knowledgeable to the extent that they've memorized the vocabulary of a field. And of course, the, the, in this case, the ideological vocabulary is very brief. It's very short. It's very abbreviated. Um, I've heard people call Maduro and Chavez Nazis and communists in the same, in the same conversation. Now, of course, these people couldn't tell you the first thing about Leninism or National Socialism. But labels are destructive of knowledge because they permit people to actually believe they know something when they don't. The, the great fears that I've always had is that people who don't know much, hearing somebody who sounds like they have authority because they use the right terminology, 
end up being completely poisoned through their pretension and, and bias. For somebody whose knowledge about this stuff comes from major publishing houses and the press, they know absolutely nothing. For reasons I've already said. But Americans, Americans are an incredibly ignorant group of people. Academics and journalists uh, are, are a big part of this. Studying international politics and international political economy is a technical field. So public opinion has no relevance to it. But since no one knows anything about um, political economy in, in the third world, these people can say whatever they please. And of course, as you all know, that's called Johnson's Law. The earth-shaking discovery. Um, and the law states clearly that to the extent that a, that a price or a country or region is obscure to Americans, the media can say whatever they want about it without any fear of contradiction. It could be a straight-out lie or it could just be a mistake because they don't know anything. The only key element is that there are very few people around to challenge it. Now, the fact that it's obscure doesn't mean it's not important. It's just far outside of the daily life of the average uh, mass man. And the Venezuelan situation is, is yet another very depressing example of this. I'm hearing some of our nationalist people calling him a communist. And I, I thought that our people knew what these terms meant. But the Communist Party is in the coalition that opposes Maduro, so I'm not entirely sure how that works. And of course, they're in favor of, of distributivism and, and, and private property to peasants and everything else. No Leninist could ever, could ever do that. Um, yeah, this is almost as bad as 2014 Ukraine. And the, yeah, the, the, the essential trajectory is the same. There's an election. The wrong guy wins. And the U.S., with oligarchs in the country, immediately denounced the, the results as unfair. There's very little hard evidence for this. And when you actually read into it, which very few people do, you realize that there's no evidence at all. The problem with the Venezuelan case is very interesting is that, at least in Ukraine in 2004, the pro-American candidate had actually run for president. In this case, they put their their money in a guy who wasn't even in the presidential race. And the guy's an absolute nobody. And of course, this guy, we all know, Guaido, is, is, uh, was educated in the U.S., like almost all of these um, liberal politicians elsewhere uh, are. So whenever an, an anti-American um, national socialist or, or nationalist uh, politician is elected, it is an unfair and non-democratic election. In the case of places like Serbia or Belarus, the condemnation of the election is actually printed out before it takes place. Corporate NGOs worth billions of dollars, a strong CIA presence, threats to the ruling party from Washington, and the anti-Maduro corporate presence apparently had nothing to do with biasing the election in the opposition's favor. But of course, that's exactly what happened. The only the only manipulation of the election came from the Americans. Because the U.S., through the CIA and, and, and USAID and everything else, have far more power than the Venezuelan government does. Now, there's an institution that the CIA created, and, and admits that they created, uh, through, through USAID, called the um, MUD, or M-U-D, um, the uh, Democracy Alliance Roundtable. Um, but the, the American press, again, not really knowing very much, um, make reference to this assembly, which we take to be a, a legislature. Um, and of course, the press, all, no matter who, what newspaper or, or TV show it is, they, they say the exact same things using the same words. This is also typical, and of course proves that they're all working together. Of course, the largest party, and the most popular party, in the country is the United Socialist Party, which is a national socialist uh, group, which was Chavez's party and, and, and owns, or uh, ha, uh, has been elected to 55 out of 167 seats. And then the third largest party is also allied with his, and they have 25. The Democratic Roundtable, it's called, um, brings everyone from 
the Communist Party to neoliberals into one huge coalition. Um, and the only, again, these groups would never cooperate under any circumstances unless, of course, a third party came in and manipulated it. According to USAID, um, the annual report, the U.S. has spent about $20 million since the death of Chavez to overthrow his government. Um, the press says the Supreme Court of the country is pro Maduro. I've never seen any evidence of this. But they did disqualify some members of this for electoral fraud. There's no doubt in my mind, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, that there, some of these parties are directly created by Americans and, and staffed by Americans. Somehow, the United States is, is dedicated to preserving the, the Constitution of Venezuela. The problem is that in April 2002, the U.S. financed a coup which sought to, in fact, overthrow the 1999 Constitution. In fact, um, uh, Pedro Carmona had declared himself president repealed and revoked the Constitution and, and repealed all of Chavez's law. He then dissolved the Supreme Court, the Attorney General, the National Electoral Council, the National Assembly, the Comptroller, and all of this done under American neoliberal uh, authority was considered legitimate and praiseworthy. September of 2012, David de Lima, who was the governor of a uh, province that I can't pronounce, published a paper. I mean, some of these people were, were supporters of the um, Democratic Roundtable. And he published some of the interior secret papers of this group that shows that it is far more neoliberal, free trade, and, and, and dominated by Americans than they admit in public. A guy named William uh, Oyeda, also a member of, of the opposition, discovered this, conferred with Delima, and exposed the CIA creation. He then was thrown out of his party and sided with Maduro and his ally. Aldo Carmeno did the exact same thing. Once this was exposed, four very small, almost non-existent parties withdrew from the coalition. You'll notice that this, this coalition, this uh, roundtable, has very little support in the country. Um, starting roughly in 2002, USAID created the Office of Transition Initiatives, which were thrown out of the country because they were convicted of all, for, all kinds of, of currency uh, um, illegalities and everything else. Uh, from roughly 2002 to 2014, almost 100 million have been given to this roundtable and other CIA-based groups. And because of this, the government had to pass the law of political sovereignty and national self-determination, which forbade foreign money in politics. Now the U.S. has been violating that law over and over again. They use all kinds of front companies. They use banks. The other organization, of course, is the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, in 2014, gave 2.3 million, and um, both in, in federal and in local electoral interference, uh, building youth leaders, uh, teaching them about different kinds of technology, uh, manipulation, propaganda, all the rest of it. Uh, they also formed a group called Forma which not too long ago was one of the bigger opposition groups, which is uh, actually directly headed by the banks. Um, the Credit Bank of, of Venezuela, uh, headed by Garcia Mendoza. And that bank is the main conduit for illegal U.S. money to interfere in Venezuelan politics. And he's funded most of these major uh, so-called coalitions and initiatives all over the country. So here you have a banker, of course, educated in America, um, acting as the intermediary. So they're they're just getting lazy. They're not even they're not even trying to cover their tracks anymore. 
And one of the things that the NED does, of course, it buys newspapers. Like any uh, PR company does, it, 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 it plants stories and everything else. And it's uh, created all kinds of um, new media sources and, and newspapers and bought out other ones. And this American-funded media has become more and more hysterical as it condemns the government. But the Finance and Democratic Unity Roundtable, I'm sorry, that's actually the name of it, is in violation of Venezuelan law. Uh, the other organization is the U.S. International Republican Institute. So here you have these kind of semi-private, semi-public corporations using front companies and banks in Venezuela to funnel cash to overthrow the government. Um, so, you know, parties like, I mean, there's, there's directly, uh, some of these parties, you see there's a whole bunch of parties in Venezuela, almost with no people. Uh, there's only a few parties that really matter. So the coalition looks like it's this huge list of parties. Um, but first justice and, 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 um, popular will, these parties, you know, have increasingly long and complicated names, um, and you know, the, the president of IRI, uh, George Folsom, said that the, quote, the Institute served as a bridge between the nation's political parties and civil society groups to help Venezuelans forge a new democratic future. And he said that right after the 2002 coup attempt. Civil society is a code word, refers to um, people owning businesses, multimillionaires. These are the only people who matter in terms of elections. But the MUD is, is suspicious for a whole lot of reasons. I mean, it's clearly a CIA creation. These institutions are, are not shy about explaining and bragging about how much money they've given to them. But so many of these, these parties have been founded very recently and have very few people. There's only one party, the, uh, the party I just mentioned, uh, Justice First, which was created straight from USAID, is the only really major party here, and it has only 33 seats in the Assembly. Founded in 2000. There's another one called National Convergence, which has exactly zero seats in the Assembly. Another party is called Fearless People's Alliance, which is based around one person, Antonio um, Nzema, who won an award from the National Endowment for Democracy, proving that there's an obvious connection. It, of course, has no seats in the Assembly. Another one is called the Ecological Movement of Venezuela. Only founded in 2010. They have, you know, 30, 40 members. And the, the award for the longest name of a political party goes to the movement for a responsible, sustainable, and entrepreneurial Venezuela. Uh, which may or may not exist because the website is defunct. Now, I wasn't really going to do this topic today because I've done two on Latin America over the last two weeks. But then I discovered a party called Come Venezuela. And it's as if The Onion did a segment on a party that the CIA founded for the sake of its own interests. Or, or Saturday Night Live created a skit about how the CIA would go about doing this. Clearly, this one is not created by the top brass. It's one of the worst attempts at creating an actual political party in a country, trying to make it seem like it's Venezuelan. And once I discovered this and went through their very bizarre website, which, by the way, has an English section. I don't know why it would have an English section. I don't think there are any Venezuelans who only speak English. But it's so bad that it's funny. It's like the ISIS, uh, Charlie's Angels pictures, you know. It has one member in the assembly, but technically isn't a political party. Now, I don't know how legally that operates, but not being a political party means they don't have to uh, reveal the sources of its funding or anything else, but they still run independently, maybe one or two people, and they've won a single election, I guarantee you the ballot box was stuffed. 
and they they're not recognized as a party because they don't have any supporters. They can't get enough signatures to make that happen. Now, they don't really have a platform. Um, what little they have on there is this pure French revolutionary stuff done in a very American accent, so to speak. Its central concern is what they say, property without adjectives. I think what that means is the absolute right, private property being the center of the society. And of course, that's, you know, classic middle class uh, American nonsense. But it really is a case study, a humorous case study in how bad and cynical these guys uh, uh, can be. Now, the platform itself, though, is nowhere to be found. You would think that's one thing that a party will have on its website is its uh, platform. Not these guys. I've been studying politics, philosophy, and history now for 30 years. And I've never come across a party that refuses to talk about what it believes in. In fact, if you search long enough, you'll see that they say, well, our platform doesn't exist it's not really a political thing. It's really just a general set of principles. But they still don't even say what that is. I think I found like a paragraph. But clearly, this is a purely American invention. And there is no Venezuelan who has anything to do with this. Now, let me... Uh, here, here's the closest I can get to any kind of a, a, an agenda by this party. This is, a, uh, this is a machine translation, but Spanish, so it's easy. Um, I mean, outside of the name, come Venezuela. There's a, there's a, there's a comma in there. You know, anyway, here's what it says. Our focus is on the free individual as the best alternative to the collectivist, populist, and totalitarian agendas that traditionally are associated with Venezuela and Latin America. That is why in come Venezuela, we break with the traditional dis uh, discussion I think they mean distinction, between left and right, and propose a new paradigm in which oppression and freedom are opposed. Our proposal goes beyond traditional ideologies. It's about values and rights, and its focus is on the free and responsible citizen. There is no way a Venezuelan wrote that. But how is setting up Freedom and oppression as opposites. How is this a, a, a new paradigm? It says absolutely nothing. Going beyond traditional ideology. They don't say anything. We believe in freedom and oppose oppression. This is as far as I can get. As far as this group's agenda. But what really gives it away is that no one in Venezuela running a political party is going to call its own civilization totalitarian. It's clearly the point of view of an American. Um, now, the other, the real big uh, giveaway that it's purely an American creation is the use of the word populist. Because only within the American elite is the term populist used as a pejorative. In fact, it's used all the time against non-globalist parties everywhere, uh, as if it's a bad thing. Um... The, the tiny little bit about their beliefs um, that they have, that they allow us to read, uh, there, there's, there's one picture of a party meeting in Caracas that has like 15 people, and everyone there looks like they could live next to me. These are Americans. Um, or, or, you know, very Americanized Venezuelans. Now, there's only really one candidate that they run. Her name is uh, Maria Corina. Of course, educated in America. And you think she comes from poverty? You think? You think she comes? No, of course, she comes from a multimillionaire um, a tycoon in the steel industry. And you could probably, not even knowing anything about her, you could pretty much write her biography. You know, I guess the entire thing right. I think she lives in North Carolina. Um, she's founded a bunch of feminist groups in the country. Of course, speaks English perfectly. Uh, she went to Yale, and and, and you know, I there's a 
there's an essay on this site, an appeal to the military. Now, she's in some trouble because the government is saying that she is approaching officers trying to put together a coup. Now, I think that growing up in this life of indulgence and luxury has really made this woman an idiot. You can't, you can't say that, that I'm being oppressed and say that there's no evidence when you actually have an essay on your website approaching the military asking them to help you take over. Now, if that's not enough evidence, I got even a better one. There's a guy named William Caballero. Now, there's two people here named William. I, I never associated that with, with Spanish-speaking countries. There's two people I mentioned already named William, both in the opposition. This man has, in an essay he's written somewhere else, and it's been published on the site, he has one agenda, one plank in his platform, and it has nothing to do with Venezuela at all. Believe it or not, his big thing is the return of American capital that had been nationalized by Chavez and his successors. And the article uh, is called President Guaido Must Request the Repatriation of Capital. There's another article that uh, I don't think he wrote. It's unsigned. The title is We Have Shown on the Streets that We're a Majority. And yet it has exactly one representative in the assembly. Every picture they have on there from a rally shows a handful of people. There's three or four other people mentioned on the site. They're just names with no biographies. You know, and of course this party, if the U.S. succeeds, is going to be very powerful. It has no connection with Venezuela at all. Um, its leaders speak English, educated in America, and the closest thing I could find to a platform is some guy saying the new government has to give Americans back their nationalized property. How, how, how is that anything to even bring up in an election in Venezuela? How is that going to buy you any kind of popularity? I mean, that's how bad it is. That's how blatant the manipulation is. It's not really a political party, even though it has exactly one member of the, of course, it's this, uh, this airhead, Corina. And God, oh, she's an airhead. You should, you should hear her. Speaks English without an accent. And, um, every word out of her mouth, every, every phrase, every sentence is a cliche. It's one after another after another. I can't find a single fact that she utters. Anyway. Eva uh, Golinger, who uh, some time ago wrote a book on American uh, manipulation of the politics of the country. Um, again, talking about the you know the, the actual mechanics of controlling a country from the outside, the new sort of colonialism. She says, detailed in a report published by the Spanish Institute, FRIDE, in 2010, international agencies that fund the Venezuelan opposition violate currency control laws in order to get their dollars to the recipient. Also confirmed in the report was the fact that the majority of international agencies, with the exception of the European Commission, are bringing in foreign money and changing it on the black market, in clear violation of the law, of course. In some cases, the agencies open bank accounts abroad for the Venezuelan groups, where they bring them the money directly in cash, actual hard cash. The U.S. Embassy in Caracas, could also use diplomatic pounds to bring large quantities of unaccounted for dollars and euros into the country that are later handed over illegally to anti-government groups in Venezuela. I mean, here you have the most clear-cut smoking gun evidence that this so-called uh, opposition is completely fraudulent. As I've been saying since I was 17 years old, Liberal democracy in the third world, really anywhere, but in the third world definitely, is the same thing as giving local and foreign millionaires full, full control over your society. I mean, USAID actually, you know, like they did in Ukraine and Serbia, um, 
They actually write speeches for these guys. They write down platforms. They get them together and teach them how to use um, you know, different new social media things. They actually have classrooms and everything else. So you have this so-called roundtable that has something like 15 parties. You're supposed to be very impressed by this. But really only two parties matter. And neither one is anywhere close to the ruling party. And that's because of the immense popularity of, of Hugo Chavez. Chavez won his first election in 1999. And all of his elections, he's won, he's won by at least 10%. International bodies from the EU to the Organization of American States, the Union of South American Nations, even the Carter Center, is absolutely unanimous in saying that these elections were free and fair. Jimmy Carter said the Venezuelan electoral system was the best in the world. I guess that is until last year. But as I've said 10 years ago on this show, Chavez is yet one more reason to know that National Socialism works in practice. It is the only political ideology that, when it's consistently applied, brings tremendous results. Nationalism and its cultural, um, and linguistic and, and, and religious uh, core, and socialist in the sense that it's egalitarian and, and, and pro-labor, pro-farmer, and distributivist, really, pro-private property on a small scale. And we've been through on this show almost every country. The third world, national socialism is, is the central ideology. Only a few countries actually call it that, like the Social Nationalist Party in Syria, the military government in Burma for a while. But wherever it's trying, it leads to rapid development, um, incredibly high wages, uh, developing really fast, tremendous social programs that, that, that produce literacy and everything else. It works everywhere. Under Chavez, about 1.5 million Venezuelans learned to read. UNESCO said in 2005 that Venezuela had eradicated illiteracy, something that the U.S. has failed to do. The number of children attending schools increased from 6 million in 98 to 13 million in 2011 and up from there. The enrollment rate now is 93.2%, which is far above Detroit. In secondary school, the enrollment rose 54%, now 73% in 2011, and far higher now. College students, from 895,000 to 2.3 million. And many new universities were built. Almost 8,000 new medical centers and hospitals were created in Venezuela under Chavez. The number of doctors went from 20 per 100,000 in 99 to almost 100 per 100,000 in 2010, which in that period of time is about a 400% increase, and it's gone up since then, of course, except for recently. You had four, uh, uh, 534 million medical visits. Um, that wouldn't have been possible without Chavez. But in 98, fewer than 2 million people had access to a doctor. Infant mortality fell from 19 per 1,000 to 10 per thousand in 2012. Life expectancy went up from 72 to 74 in that same period of time. And until this recent crisis, the economy was booming. The poverty rate decreased from 44% to 26%. And extreme poverty went down from 17% to 7% from 99 to 2011. Now, the Gini coefficient measures wealth inequality. And this is important. You could have substantial economic growth, but if it's non-productive in the hands of a handful of rentiers, then it's meaningless. Um, the Gini coefficient is based on the number between zero and one. Zero is total equality, meaning everyone has the exact same amount of wealth, or no wealth, while one would be total inequality, that is, one person would control everything. Now, world inequality is at 0.38, almost 4. Uh, the U.S. is 0.5, 
And to be honest with you, I think it's far higher than that since so much of the elite's money is abroad and hidden. Um, the most unequal countries are in Africa. Um, I think uh, Natovo and, and Botswana are almost at, at 0.7, meaning that only a tiny handful of people control everything. Now in Venezuela, it was um, 0.46 in 99, and it went down to 0.39 in 2011, and that's that's a big deal. You don't have a huge range here. You don't have a big range, um, really from, I don't know, the highest is, is 0.65 to maybe 0.25, which, by the way, is Slovenia. But, of course, today in Venezuela, that's a memory. The economy boomed here. Child malnutrition was reduced by 40% since 99. In 99, 82% of the population had access to safe drinking water. Now it's almost 100%. Well, up until this crisis, of course. The number of, of senior citizens receiving a pension went from 300,000 to 2.5 million. American sanctions have destroyed all of this. Now remember, sanctions in Russia or China, or well, you really can't put sanctions on China, but you can in a strategic way, they don't mean much, because Russia doesn't trade much with the United States. Venezuela's number, number one trading partner is the U.S. All of its oil is bought by the U.S. So that means sanctions bite very, very hard. But they're cruel because they force citizens to make a choice. Either they accept grinding poverty that they know the government hasn't caused, or overthrow a ruler that they generally like and accept foreign control. So, in this way, the U.S. can invade and overthrow a country without actually lifting a finger. It uses money and food as a weapon. And remember, this is what democracy means. In practice, not on paper, but in practice. One faction that's trying to overthrow the government is, is the old landowning class. Because Chavez, who some idiots call a communist, had as his main policy most of the military, and he was of course a military man, most of the military governments, actually all the military governments in Latin America, really had the policy that if you could farm the land, it's yours. Under Chavez, it was no different. Um, they redistributed about 3 million hectares of, of land under him, and was almost self-sufficient in food. And even food consumption total went up by almost 100% since 99. Venezuela would be totally independent in that respect had sanctions not occurred. You know, um, of course the other thing that Chavez and his, his party did that really one of the main things that pissed the U.S. off was um, nationalizing the main oil company, in 2003. That permitted the country to actually become sovereign again. Um, Petrocarbon, or Petrocarib, whatever it is, was Chavez's creation, and it brings together 18 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, as a way to subsidize energy supplies for those who can't afford it. If you remember, uh, I think Chavez's last year, he was offering Americans who couldn't afford their gas bills, subsidized energy. Just proving how the difference between the two systems. He also nationalized the electrical and telecommunications sector. Because prior to that, they were private monopolies. Ultimately, Chavez is still a very popular man in Venezuela. He eliminated, like, like all of these guys, it's all the same thing. Before he took over, unemployment was almost 20%. It was just over 6% in 2012. Um, the minimum wage went up hundreds of percent. Minimum wage went from $16.98 to $330 in 2012. I think that's a, I think that's a month. The dollar figure doesn't mean much, you know, when filling up your tank is like 80 cents. You know, when, when people say that, that all these poor people are living on a dollar a day, I say, well, how much does it cost to live? A dollar a day might be fine. A dollar a day in America is a problem. 
Again, it just shows you how dumb people are. They don't even know how to... An important statistic, too, is, is that the number of people making the minimum wage went way down. In 99, 65% of the workforce earned that minimum wage. In 2012, only 21%. And by the way, because the economy was doing so well under Chavez, he reduced the working day to six hours and 36 hours a week without a loss of pay. That you have not read in the American press. Of course, public debt went way down. And then once he repaid his long-term debt, which he did early, by the way, just like Russia, the Russians did, he kicked the IMF out of the country. National socialism works. All the countries we've dealt with, whether it be you know, South Korea or Taiwan or Belarus, Hitler's Germany, uh, Putin, uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, you know, we, Franco Spain. Of course, these governments are different from one another. But they're, the contexts are different, of course, but they're all nationalist and they're all socialist in the true idealistic sense of the word, not in the materialist sense of the word. Socialism doesn't mean Leninism. Marxism was able to use his connections with the Rothschilds, as Bakunin said, to destroy all other forms of socialism. The forms of socialism prior to Marx were very healthy. All forms of distributivism, um, Prudhonism, even some idealistic and Christian forms of anarchism were all very, like you had in Russia, were extremely healthy and they worked. People want to cooperate, not compete. But they do compete it's at the local level with a full knowledge and understanding of customers. National socialism works wherever it's trying. So why has the economy collapsed? Now, there are, generally speaking, some wild, exaggerated reports. But all of the statistics that I just cited to you, which all come from the World Bank, by the way, um, have all been wiped out. This is the greatest evil of the American system and why the U.S., the U.S. military, and the government has to be opposed with every fiber in our being. These countries were on the verge of first world status. Venezuela would be a first world country. Peru would be. Chile would be. They would have uh, followed the same path. Uh, South Korea and Taiwan. And China, for that matter. Of course, we're talking... And, 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 and Iran is actually a first world country today, which no one's bothered to mention. I have a whole broadcast explaining how that's true. Uh, a few months ago. But would it be Libya or Syria, Yugoslavia, Iraq? I mean, these were countries that were doing extremely well. The end of Yugoslavia is a different matter, that's true, but, but prior to that, it was doing well. If you want to have a humane form of socialism, of course, Tito probably was it. A lot of what Tito did was, was praiseworthy, despite his, his, uh, his problems in other areas. This is why he was opposed so violently by the Soviet Union. The fact remains that the destruction of the economy comes from American sanction. I hate it when writers who don't know much say things like whether about Russia or Venezuela that, well, the economy is based on oil prices. It isn't true. I could do my own regression analysis showing that there is no connection in Russia between oil prices and economic growth. And the same is true of Venezuela. Now, I can't say that about their exports, but the export money just goes to diversify the economy locally. About 8% of the Russian economy is based on oil. It's a bit higher in Venezuela. Actually, uh, Norway is more dependent on oil revenues than, than Russia is. Um, but the cause of the destruction of the economy is when your number one foreign trade partner and other countries that hold a lot of your foreign exchange reserves freeze them and refuse to trade with you and will punish any country that does. 
2015, because of all that I've mentioned to you, Barack Obama issued an executive order stating that Venezuela is an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. I'll give you a minute to have that soak in here. Now, he has to say that because you can't put sanctions on a country without saying that. How is Venezuela an extraordinary and unusual threat? Extraordinary threat. The national security of the U.S. The only thing it could possibly mean is the nationalization of American oil for, uh, of, of American uh, oil companies and other firms in the country, giving them over to the state, labor boards, cooperatives, etc. And his appeal to the world, because of course the man is off, you know, I, I can't imagine Maduro's getting any sleep. He wrote his appeal to, appeal to the world. He says this, I'm going to quote it here, I want you to listen. This coup attempt is an abject, illegal interference in another country's sovereignty. The ultimate, violent, and vicious goal that Washington has been practicing over the last hundred years around the globe, and ever with more impunity, of regime change, to steal a non-conforming, non-submissive government's resources, and of course, to reach eventually the ultimate goal of full-spectrum world dominance. Venezuela has by far the world's largest known hydrocarbon, uh, hydrocarbon reserves, which is two-day shipping time from Texas oil refineries, versus, of course, the Arabian Gulf, from where today the U.S. imports 6% of its oil, which I don't think is true, by the way, a shipping time of 40, 45 days, much higher shipping costs, plus the risk of having to sail through the Iran-controlled Gulf of Hormuz. Clearly, the fifth column is at work in Venezuela for years, bringing down the downfall of the economy by monetary and oil price manipulation from outside and from within, by diverting food and medicine shipments from being delivered to supermarkets and instead being transferred as contraband to Colombia, they are sold at multi a dollar manipulated and played to local currency. Now, I think the 60% is a bit high. Um, the U.S. is not that dependent on Middle Eastern oil, but still, the point is made. When the U.S. puts sanctions on Venezuela, it could do a lot of damage unlike places like Russia or Belarus. Even today, I think you may have heard this, the, pro, the pro-nationalist the site uh, Venezuela Analysis has had their Facebook page taken down for violating the terms of service. This is, this is at a point of crisis where you have these tech firms Uniformly liberal, of course. Uniformly leftist. The main source of political debate, the main forum for political debate in America, having the power to censor what they please. The founders of the American Republic couldn't possibly have foreseen this. The notion that a handful of, of tech companies can mediate almost all political speech Anyway, in 2017, uh, Obama's order was renewed in early January to provide a, quote, smooth transition to the Trump presidency. In other words, Obama said, and I quote here again, this will ensure that the new administration will not need to immediately undertake renewals necessary to safeguard our national security as it works to put its national security team in place and secure Senate confirmation of relevant appointees. And what is, what is the American uh, so-called rebel, the resident socialist said? Bernie Sanders called Chavez a dead communist dictator. Proving what that man really is. He's a media image and he's absolutely nothing else than that. By the way, if you hear cats fighting, those are, that's, that's brother and sister Stanley and Sandy, who've been fighting a lot recently. But that's what Bernie Sanders really is. He's a complete fraud. Some of you may have heard of Philip Agui, who's dead now. He was a communist, uh, former CIA operative. He lived in Cuba most of his life. He wrote Inside the Company, a CIA diary in the 1970s. Now, a lot of what he's done I vehemently disagree with, but 
his description of his own work and the CIA in Latin America matches everything else that that's out there um, concerning the American role. Uh, and basically, what he says in a recent interview, uh, really just 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 before his death, um, right right before his death. His main argument was what the CIA is doing now because there is this law that foreign money can't be used in elections. Which of course, is in Russia too. Not a law in America. They then have to create Venezuelan-owned companies. Now, this come Venezuela party, I think, is one of them. It's not even a party. It doesn't have to. Uh, it doesn't have to um, report its earnings or where they're from, which is why they're not one of the reasons they're not a party. Um, but they, they create these shell firms, shell companies and institutions, even even foundations, that then can be used to funnel cash. And um, uh, Aggie says that right after the failed coup in 2002, um, the CIA that, that, that he had been a part of had created a set of front companies, uh, consulting firms and things like that. And um, about $10 million a year were given to the so-called MUD. Uh, I mean, it's true. I mean, Agi is, is is a disgusting guy. Oleg Kulugin of the KGB said that, yes, he was a communist. He was working for us. He's one of the creators of the whole death squad nonsense in Latin America. But he did found Covert Action Bulletin, which is kind of the first WikiLeaks before the Internet. Um, and he has properly connected um, corporate capital and the CIA and the U.S. military. So then who is Juan Guaido? That's a question that most Venezuelans are asking right now. Because no one's heard of him there. What What's bizarre about him, again, he's never run for president. He's had no connection with the executive office. And very recently was apolitical. Of course, he's, he's educated in America, like they all are. Um... But he was elected only in 2015 with 80,000 votes, total 80,000 votes in a small constituency. But then only three years later was made president of the legislature. He won the election with a plurality, meaning there's there's several, more than two candidates, so the highest percentage wins, even though it's not a, it's not a majority. He won 26% of the vote, which was sufficient to give him that seat. So he had no, no, he has no mandate at all. Out of nowhere, with a huge, you know, well-funded campaign again from out of nowhere, and three years later is made president of the legislature. Do you think it's a little fast? Weren't there more senior guys available for this job? Again, like the very existence of the round table, only foreign involvement can explain it. And by the way, the other Latin American countries recognizing this guy, it's not because they care. It's not because they know anything, you know, they support him. It's because the United States is saying to them, you want these sanctions too. We'll put your, your, your economy in the same state as, as Venezuela's. And of course, they'd rather that not be the case. Losing the American market will doom an economy. Now, Russia, of course, um, as I've been saying for 20 years, is maneuvering to not only expose the American fraud here, but assist the economy in any way possible. Sergei Lavrov, the, um, the foreign minister, the chief diplomat of the country, says that this freezing of dollar-based accounts abroad is just theft. And one of the main concerns is freezing the $7 billion of the um, CITGO, which is the, well, that's the American subsidiary of, the, of, of, of um, PDVSA, the state-run oil firm, which has been nationalized, as we said. And, of course, simply taking the money. Um, American companies operating in Venezuela are excluded from the sanctions, of course. So, in other words, as Lavrov said, they want to overthrow the government and still make a profit at the same time. So, Lavrov and several others are saying just what we've said about the come Venezuela party, 
the American-backed civil war here is meant to take back nationalized property. And as, as it stands now, Chinese investment, China has probably more to lose here financially than any other, any other country. Um, now, there's even more to this here. Um, John Bolton, who, as you know, is the, the chicken hawk uh, voice of the neocon movement in the White House. Um, he's just another uh, more ignorant John McCain. And he has been threatening Maduro with, with violence. The day of reckoning awaits, as he said. Um, but Bolton, Bolton is, is stupid. He, he's, he's an ignorant man. And sometimes he doesn't know what he's saying. And, and he kind of let the cat out of the bag without realizing it in his, the way that he blurts stuff out. He said this on, on Fox News. He said, we're in conversation with American Major American companies now. It would make a difference if we could have American companies produce the oil in Venezuela. It would be good for Venezuela and the people of the United States. He said that to uh, Trish Reagan on Fox. And he said that ousting Maduro would be a potential major step forward for business opportunities in the area. But just before that, remember, he said the same thing about Libya. The exact quote is, we'll help you, we want 50% of your oil. I don't think he meant to be that blunt. But, you know, because Americans can't think in systematic terms, it has no social impact. He can say that, and this is what nominalism does. When you have the positivist, you know, scientific nominalist mentality, you don't have this in, in places like Latin America. No one can think in systematic terms. The nominalist can only see individual things occurring without substantial connections to anything else. So the American who hasn't broken out of the nominalist mentality will hear Bolton say this and not be able to put together the notion, uh, the systemic notion that the U.S. government is in fact an arm of capital. And it's getting worse as the government gets more in debt. We said last week that when England uh, owed the government of Juan Perón in Argentina uh, hundreds of millions uh, from World War II, uh, agricultural products from World War II, they just called his government fascist, and so we don't have to pay. Today, the same Bank of England says Maduro is fascist, so we don't have to pay. Maduro uh, has just over a billion dollars in gold that was deposited there. They're not giving it back. Exact same bank, exact same, because a lot of the, the debt uh, was was actually maintained. The paper was actually in the Bank of England and was denominated in Bank of England notes. So what's happening is that the U.S. government is going to starve out the country unless it hands over its oil and other strategic industries to American capital. That's what this is. John Bolton pretty much came out and said that. The evidence I presented here is pretty much overwhelming. Um, and this has global significance. Now, I talk about these things, you talk about speaking in systematic terms, because I'm convinced that the end times are actually coming. The Orthodox Church very rarely talks about the end times. Protestant sects often come into existence with some charismatic leader talking about the end times. It's become a joke. The Orthodox very rarely talk about it, except now. And this is how um, the Lucifer, Prometheus, set, whatever you want to call him, takes over the society by the worship of money. By the domination of money, which dissolves everything, because it, everything can be denominated in, in money, in dollar terms, and therefore nothing actually exists. The human person then projects his greed out into the world and doesn't actually see people. He sees um, exploitation opportunities. And that's what the New World Order is. The New World Order is um, the economic self-interest of state-connected corporations to destroy nations. Because nations are a problem. Nations uh, have different currencies, different regulations. Some of them don't like Americans very much. And they could stand in the way of 
a frictionless transaction with different parts of the world. To create a single world market in labor would mean labor would be paid almost nothing. The destruction of culture, language, religion would mean that there is absolutely no foundation for rebellion. And this is what the communists and the anarchists, this is why they serve the interests of the capitalists, because they don't give any foundation for rebellion. Money is not sufficient. I'm not making as much as, as my manager does, therefore I'm going to shoot the president. That doesn't make sense. Rebellion always comes. Real rebellion, not the stage managed rebellion. But real rebellion comes from naturalism, it comes from cultural tradition, it comes from hearth and home, it comes from the violation of the way of life. It comes from a sense that, that God-given rights and responsibilities have been violated. That's the foundation for revolution, and has always been the only foundation for revolution. But when you destroy that, which is exactly the goal of these people, no one can rebel. There's no, there's no way, you know, if you accept this pure self-interest, cynical way of life, when you're crushed by the corporations, you have no right to complain. If you accept the same self-interest uh, ideology, the same egocentrism, the same uh, randism that, that they do, they could say, we believe in equality. We all should be able to speak equally. Yeah, except that when Warren Buffett speaks, everyone listens. When I speak, no one does. The equality uh, hides the real fact, which is it means oligarchy. Only a handful of people matter in that sense. Now, it's true that... Um, I'm sorry, one of the, one of the things that... that creates this is a is a make-believe media that's engaged in entertainment, infotainment, as they call it, not education. I'll say it one more time. Newspapers, TV shows, stand-up comics, which, by the way, give a huge amount of political information to people. Late-night talk shows, which is a big, also a big source of political information for Americans. They're not obligated to teach you anything. The New York Times is not obligated by any legal or moral code to tell you the truth. This has to be stressed. So with that, these kind of systems can come into existence. Um, the, um, the Venezuelan case, as we've spoken about on this show from the very beginning, I've dedicated my life to this issue instead of issues from a Russian point of view and an Orthodox point of view. This is the nature of the New World Order. This is the nature of pure capitalist oligarchy. Capitalism and Leninism, Marxism, are both revolutionary ideologies that believe the same thing. They have the same scientific, nominalist, technocratic um, approach to the world. They're almost identical, uh, except really based on the size of the state. And even there, in America, I don't know the difference between the state and corporations. Most of the government is, is privatized. So this situation in Venezuela exposes uh, American stupidity, ex exposes, uh, just another example of manipulation, although in this case, because Venezuela is relatively close to the U.S. compared to these other places in Eastern Europe, it matters more. People really are starving there, and there's only one reason for it. But it's the U.S. government and the U.S. military. Um, and these are, you know, we're talking about them in systematic terms, not personal terms. Yes, personally, they're disgusting. But that's an after effect. The system is what matters. And the system of, of Lucifer, the, the uh, God's kingdom, Israel, is small and weak. The kingdom of Prometheus is gigantic, but... Size doesn't matter in these respects. Money doesn't matter in these respects. Truth does, and the spirit does. Stay strong, my friends. We'll talk to you next time. Goodbye.